We've all found ourselves in a serious Pokemon themed debate. And when it comes to the games, one of the most common debates is which region is best? Today, we're going to be taking a look at the regions in the mainline series, their stories, their geography, their connections to the places that inspired them, and of course, to the collection of Pokemon associated with each of them. Welcome to PokeBinge. These are Pokemon regions worst to best. There may not be a single easy choice in this list, but we're pretty confident in placing Galar at the bottom of our ranking. The franchise's first mainline console outing in Sword and Shield was a rough one, frequently criticized for lackluster graphics and bare-bones world design. That second one isn't an entirely unfair accusation, although we do have to give credit to Galar's vast open spaces like the Wild Area, Isle of Armor, and Crown Tundra. These represent the series' first foray into open open world game design, of finally taking the rails off the gameplay and allowing the player to explore to their heart's content and discover new Pokemon to catch. The developers would expand on this concept in later games, but in Sword and Shield, it suffers from being shackled to the rest of Galar, a long sequence of straight roads and tunnels connecting towns that may look lovely from the outside, but they offer very little to do once you've made it there. The region does capture some of that distinctive British flavor in its roster of Pokemon, like with the adorable Corgi, Yamper, the 007 Chameleon, and Teleon, or the Tea Time Spectres, Sinistee, and Poltegeist. But overall, there are definitely more interesting batches of monsters out there. Arguably, the coolest part of Galar is its take on the Pokemon League, here designed to resemble English League football. Massive stadiums, corporate endorsements, rowdy hooligans pumping up your rivals. It's a bold way to revitalize the tried and true Pokemon Gym Challenge after Alola went in a different direction entirely. Galar is a region suffering from an identity crisis torn between the linear series formula and the developers' experiments with open world design. It's certainly not completely without charm, but we're still showing it a yellow card for the unfortunate precedence it would set for later Switch titles. Because we'd be able to forgive Sword and Shield if Galar walked so that later games could run, regrettably, Paldea at best manages a light jog, with frequent stumbles along the way. Even setting aside the myriad performance issues and glitches, the world of Scarlet and Violet just doesn't take advantage of its open world concept as much as it could, with the gym leaders and other challenges not scaling to your level but instead remaining fixed and linear like they always have been. Area Zero and its Paradox Pokemon provide a much more intriguing hook than the legendaries of Galar ever did, showing us past and future versions of Pokemon along with a genuinely shocking story twist involving the region's professor that neatly ties into one of your rival character stories. We just wish that more had been done with that idea and that the group of friends the player character assembles by the end of their journey had had more time to shine as a team. Nimona, Penny, and Arvin each have little moments of great Great characterization, but next to them, the player's avatar feels as blank as ever. Paldea's Academy feels much the same way, an intriguing idea that isn't fleshed out very well. Maybe the school will get some more focus in the upcoming DLC, which centers on the distant Blueberry Academy, if it's as divorced from the rest of Paldea as the Teal Mask episode, though. We wouldn't expect too much. Paldea's Pokemon are at least a step up from those in Galar, with a number of cute fan favorites like Hue Coco, Pommy and Paldean Wooper, and Clodsire. We just struggle to rank this region any higher given its weak theming and failure to take advantage of the potential of a truly open world Pokemon adventure. Add back in all the bugs, and this place is lucky that it didn't take the bottom slot. But lest you think we're only here to rag on the modern games, coming up next, we've got the series' second ever region, Johto. Much like Galar, Johto is awkwardly trapped between the old and the new. In its case, however, it's because at this point in the franchise's life, the developers weren't sure how sustainable Pokemon would be as a franchise. Gold, Silver, and Crystal feel very much like an expansion pack to the original games. A large one, granted, with a lot of balance updates and a hundred new Pokemon, but an expansion pack all the same. Even with a host of references to the history and culture of Japan's Kansai region, Johto struggles to escape from the long shadow of Kanto and the global phenomenon that was the first generation of Pokemon. The choice to revisit Kanto in the post-game was a bold one in the Gen 2 games, but it results in a poorly balanced level curve for both regions. 
Additionally, several of the coolest Pokemon introduced in Gen 2, like Houndour and Mistrevis, aren't available until the Kanto postgame, making it even harder to appreciate Johto's unique contributions to the roster. Heart Gold and Soul Silver did a lot to alleviate some of the more glaring issues with these games, and they're rightfully acclaimed as some of the best remakes in the series. But many of the problems with Johto persist even in Gen 4, and we had no choice but to drop it in the rankings because of the region's inability to stand on its own like all the rest. The good news is that Johto is ripe for revisiting in a future project, whether it's one like Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee starring the region's cutest monsters like Togepi, Meryl, and Snubble, or a game like Legends Arceus delving into Johto's colorful past and its legendary birds and beasts. We know how much you love going back to old regions, Game Freak, so make it happen. Of course, Johto is not the only region that's stuck having to share the spotlight with the legacy of Kanto. The Kalos games are just as frequently accused of Gen 1 pandering, but to their credit, they do a better job of establishing their own identity. X and Y may not have many new Pokemon, but they do offer players the largest regional Pokedex to date. They may lean extensively on Gen 1 monsters, but the sheer quantity available in Kalos is indeed worth something, especially when it's backed by new favorites like Greninja, as well as distinctly Colossian entries, like the customizable poodle, Furfru. And that right there may be Kalos' greatest strength, not its status as the first properly 3D mainline entry, but rather the effort it places into representing the real-world locale that serves as its inspiration. Kalos replicates many picturesque French tourist attractions, from the sweeping grounds and Palace of Versailles, appearing as the Parfume Palace, to the island of Monsoon Shell serving as the inspiration for the Tower of Mastery. This isn't even mentioning the grand city of Lumiosi, a magnificent recreation of Paris, Eiffel Tower and all. To this day, this city remains the largest city in the Pokemon world. And while the 3D technology may not have quite been there yet, to do it justice, we still have to give Kalos major props for the effort. Even the overall silly team flair feels slightly less ridiculous in the context of French existentialism and Lysander's pursuit of idealized beauty. It's because of all those colorful expressions of the local culture that were so disappointed to see how Kalos was shortchanged in the long run. With almost no post-game beyond the Elite Four, and no sequel or third version to expand on the setting, the distinct lack of a Pokemon Z is the biggest thing holding Kalos back, and we can only hope that eventual remakes can rectify this grave oversight. Considering its inspiration, we'd love to see a tie-in with Paldea that would enhance the experience of both regions. With that said, many fans agree that the stronger Gen 6 experience comes from Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, the remakes that properly bring to life the vibrant tropical region of Hoenn. Even back in the days of Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald, Hoenn stood out from its predecessors as a region with a distinctive character all its own. It's just that half of that character is the infamous too much water bit. If you can look past the long hours of monotonous surfing and diving, you'll find a region divided between a volcano volcanic landmass and a vast ocean, between the series' first box legendaries to factor into the story, and between some of the most comically short-sighted evil teams Pokemon has ever known. The lush forests and seas of Hoenn are home to a diverse array of monsters, ranging from the meme-worthy Mudkip to the gargantuan Wailord, to enough legendary dragons to fill up a Westerosi dragon pit. Hoenn also diversifies the gameplay experience more than the regions that came before it. With glamorous Pokemon contests and Emerald's beloved Battle Frontier, and its wide variety of post-game challenges just waiting for players to master. As we said earlier, the Hoenn remakes turn the region into even more of a treat for the eyes, especially when seen on the back of your very own fast-traveling dragon mount. The evil team's plans are even sort of coherent this time around. It's a shame about the Battle Frontier, but it wouldn't be Hoenn if it didn't keep earning that IGN 7.8, would it? But props to Game Freak for being willing to try again with another region in the balmy tropics. That's what we got with the islands of Alola, which go above and beyond merely fixing Hoenn's mistakes to give us arguably the most unique region in the franchise thus far. It dispenses with the traditional eight gyms, instead challenging would-be Pokemon masters to battle trial captains, powered-up totem Pokemon, and island kahunas for their chance to be Alola's very best. This novel structure works in reference to the history and culture of Hawaii just as much as the geography of the region itself, with each of its four islands based on one of the Hawaiian archipelago.
Pokemon Go. The local Pokemon reflect the biodiversity of Hawaii as well, with analogs to an extinct owl species in Decidui, to the rivalry between native pests in the invasive species with Alolan Rattata and Yongoose, and to adaptive avian evolution with the different forms of Oricoria. Sun and Moon combine all this with one of the darkest stories ever seen in this franchise, one that poses tough questions about the role of wildlife preservation through the Aether franchise, and about the fate of those who have fallen through the cracks of society through the delinquent Team Skull. Alola might be notorious for its abundance of unskippable cutscenes, but we know that these games' presentations would be right at home in a story-focused RPG series. Unfortunately for them, Pokemon isn't really one of those series, and Ultra Sun and Moon didn't do much to improve on their predecessors in that department. Still, Alola is the ultimate in island vacations, with a unique charm and personality you'll find nowhere else in the Pokemon world. Even so, it wouldn't be possible to appreciate what Alola does so differently if the franchise formula hadn't been so well established. Enter, at last, the OG region, Kanto, our bronze medal pick. Now, if it were up to the Pokemon alone, the original roster of 151 would have to take the top spot. Pikachu, Eevee, Charizard, Mewtwo, so many of these iconic pocket monsters have been household names for over two decades, and Game Freak knows that better than any of us. Kanto those Pokemon have been awarded more powered up variant forms than those of any other region, and the setting itself has been the subject of two remakes already on top of its bonus appearances in the Johto games. For better or worse, there's no region that's more beloved in the hearts of the fans and the creators alike to the point that it can occasionally be difficult for other regions to produce anything half as memorable. So why doesn't Kanto get our top pick? Well, for all that red, blue, and especially yellow might be the definitive Pokemon experience for longtime fans, the region itself just isn't all that remarkable. The geography is extremely angular and simplistic, there's almost no story to speak of, and you'd be forgiven for not realizing that Kanto is designed to resemble the Japanese region of the same name. Not much about Saffron City screams Tokyo, certainly not in comparison to what future regions have done with their own landmarks and real-world references. Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee additionally illustrate the trouble with Kanto in comparison to more modern titles, as Eevee even its shiny new graphics and colorful art style can't disguise how rudimentary the region's design is in contrast to Alola or even Galar. On the plus side, we're glad Pokemon's region design didn't peak this entry, even if its marketable monster designs might have. Case in point, when Game Freak rebooted the Pokemon with an all-new set in black and white, the total absence of all the old favorites didn't go over well. That does not, however, detract from everything Unova has to offer, and why it's walking away with our silver medal. The sheer ambition of creating 150 new monsters and forcing players to use them exclusively is impressive. The ice cream cone Vanillish and literal trash monster Garbodor might get mocked by fans, but they fit perfectly in the modern modernized world of Unova. And just because the land is modeled after New York City doesn't mean that the entire region is an urban sprawl. There's forests, mountains, and even a desert right in the middle. And the season feature exclusive to Gen 5 allows players to enjoy the natural beauty of the region in four different flavors. The people of Unova are just as unique and diverse as the Pokemon too, representing in broad strokes the United States as a whole. Just in the ranks of the gym leaders alone, we've got a catwalk model, a a Texas flavored oil baron, and a West Coast surfer bro. Unova further continues in the vein of the preceding two regions, tying its many legendary Pokemon into the history of the region into its overarching theme of finding unity and diversity. This isn't even getting into the wannabe PETA Team Plasma and the threat they pose to the entire Pokemon world, or to how Black 2 and White 2 take the first idea seen in the Johto games of checking up again with a region a few years later and expand upon it properly. They might might have been controversial at the time, but the Gen 5 games have since become acclaimed for the bold risks that they took in storytelling and setting design. They're also next on the list of inevitable remakes, so fans have their fingers crossed that Unova will be given the love and care it deserves when its time comes around again. 
They've got reason to worry after Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, a set of remakes that prioritize fidelity to the originals over just about everything else. With such games in the rearview mirror, it might seem difficult to justify, but they're not the reason we're awarding our gold medal for best Pokemon region to Sinnoh and Hisui. It's that combination that really brings home the gold, since on its own, Sinnoh is about as average as it comes. Much like Hoenn, it's got some solid environmental storytelling going on, being a colder region centered around around a colossal mountain range and hosting a noticeable lack of fire-type Pokemon. Sinnoh's new Pokemon are also pretty solid, with both all-new additions like the cute Piplup and the badass Lucario, as well as powerful evolutions for older Pokemon like Honchkrow, Ismagius, and Weavile. Platinum is a much-appreciated upgrade to the Sinnoh experience, with its most varied Pokemon and new story involving the monstrous Giratina and the reality-bending Distortion World. But it's Pokemon Legends Arceus that earns Sinnoh the top ranking by showing us the region as it once was in the distant past. Then known as Hisui, it was a land where humans hadn't learned to live alongside Pokemon, and where the dangers posed by the region's legendaries were ever close at hand. No other game in the franchise gives players the chance to track and catch Pokemon in the great outdoors like Pokemon Arceus. And it's even more remarkable that the game adds a handful of new monsters in spite of its historical setting. We'd love to see other regions get this same kind of treatment in the future, because Sinnoh and Hisui really stand out both for their differences and for their uncanny similarities. The more things change, the more things stay the same. Might as well be the motto of a formulaic franchise like Pokemon. But Legends Arceus demonstrates that there's still plenty of room for innovation within familiar parameters. Here's to hoping that Game Freak keeps that in mind as they design future regions, and that we won't have to wait over a decade to see more of them brought to life in the same way.